Sorry for all this. Probably used to this by now. Okay, now let's get all this crap out of the way. Okay, so syllabus. Um, I was going to go over this anyway, but now you gave me something else to announce. So we're here. We're obviously a few days off. It's okay. It'll all work out in the end, okay? So we're supposed to be starting this today, but obviously we won't probably finish this. Hopefully finish it. Um, and that means on Monday and Wednesday, muscle physiology. Um, we won't have gone over a lot of it by the time we have our muscle physiology lab. Don't forget that uh, muscle physiology, you must print that out or look at it before to get those five vocab words. And I think, I think it's mostly on the first page and it might wrap around to, I think, is there any bold face? Lactic acid, oh, you know that already. Yeah, it does wrap around to the second page. But what's nice about that quiz, um, some of it you already know. Acetylcholine binds to a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, opens up sodium channels, but there's new stuff that we'll get to when we start that chapter on Monday. Okay, so um, after that, okay, so we get down to here. Uh, we're going to have the blood pressure regulation lab. It's going to be really cool. Going to learn how to use a uh, manual blood pressure cuff, but it's going to be the basis for the second lab report. So before I sign that, it's my goal to get those lab reports that you turned in back to you hopefully next week if I can get through grading this weekend, okay? Um, so this is wrong, because <laughs> seventh and eighth is fall break. So I will change that. I'll look at a time when we're next in lab and that's when it will be due. So thank you for asking that. All right, any questions for that? Okay, I don't think I need all this here. All right, so. Um, there we are. So here is where we left off. Okay. So we had talked about what the hypothalamus releases or inhibits those hormones. Okay. And so obviously the next slide is going to be what the anterior pituitary is doing in response to that. Hypothalamus is the general, issues the commands, either it tells the pituitary, okay, I want you to release hormones for this, or I want you to inhibit releasing these hormones. So we're going to flip. And I did want to remind you, I hate reducing this, but I'm going to. Look, it says page 267 in the text, what the anterior pituitary secretes. So I've got my um, wiki text open here, and I'm on page 267. And you scroll down, and there we are. All right, so it, it does... If you look at the PowerPoint and you just type into the PDF, the page you want to go to, you don't have to scroll so much. So do remember that that is there, um, the corresponding material in the textbook. All right, back to where my PowerPoint go. Did I turn it off? There we go. Okay, so, so many things, the Zoom buttons, this button. Okay. So now, around. I think I have them here. Okay, so if the hypothalamus secretes the GnRH, all right, obviously the Gn stands for gonado. So what the anterior pituitary is going to secrete in response, let's see what my pen is doing, it's going to secrete two hormones, LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone, And I have to move this little, there we go, um, FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. Now, these two hormones are going to um, spell it. Do you know when you talk and write at the same time, you can make really interesting spelling mistakes because it's a part of your brain there? Both of those are gonna affect activities in the testes and the ovaries, all right? All right, we'll get to that in the next slide. GHRH stands for growth hormone releasing hormone. So if the pituitary gets that command, it's gonna secrete growth hormone. And I talked to you a little bit, was it Wednesday? Yeah, where'd the week go? 
uh, that growth hormone affects almost all the tissues in your body because when your tissues repair themselves through mitosis, growth hormone is the thing that does it. Yeah, um, so it can affect your bones, your muscles, everything, all right? And I was saying, watch patients who um, say they're taking growth hormone for whatever reason, if it's not prescribed, they shouldn't be doing that. Okay, CRH, the C stands for cortico, cortico. It's gonna affect... It affects a cortex, the adrenal cortex. So that's what that C stands for. It will make the pituitary release ACTH. And that AC is going to tell you what glandular structure it's going to affect. So it stands for adrenal corticotropic hormone. Oh, I did it again. Notice I keep um, spelling home. Maybe that's subconsciously. I wish I wasn't home in bed, right? Like you guys, it's interesting. Okay, so the adrenal cortical is for adrenal cortex. So I know these are long, long words, but if you look at why they're named that way, it tells you what it's going to be affecting. So that kind of helps you out. Okay, TRH. The T is for thyro tropin releasing hormone and that makes the pituitary anterior pituitary secrete um tsh which is thyroid <laughs> stimulating hormone and there's no guessing about what that's going to do okay then the last releasing hormone at least that i covered was a uh, prolactin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus so if the pituitary gets that signal, it will secrete prolactin, okay? And what does the lactin refer to? Lactation, okay? Think of lactate as the thing you add to milk for people who don't have the enzyme to break down the sugar. So prolactin, think prolactation. Okay, then there's two inhibiting hormones. One that inhibits the growth hormone, one that inhibits the prolactin secretion. So if the hypothalamus secretes growth hormone inhibiting hormone, then the pituitary stops growth hormone secretion. All right, because of the powerful effects of growth hormone, there is a definite control over that. Okay, now I left off last lecture, um, if the hypothalamus secretes a PIH, prolactin inhibiting hormone, it stops prolactin secretion. And most adult women, you go your entire life with the PIH being secreted and prolactin secretion being inhibited. The only time this is stopped being secreted from the hypothalamus and it switches to secreting this. And then the pituitary makes that because the woman's in the like late stage of pregnancy, certainly after childbirth, all right? So that's when the prolactin makes the milk. But what's the hormone that causes the milk letdown? Oh, oxytocin, all right? Okay, all right, good, you're holding on to stuff. So this is a figure showing where those anterior pituitary hormones are having their effect, all right? So prolactin, growth hormone, the gonadotropins, FSH and LH, ACTH and TSH. So it, if you want to study the entire endocrine system, you could do it in these three slides back to back. All right. Another way is the flow diagram that I have. And I think I have a link within the PowerPoint. Okay. So prolactin makes the mammary glands make milk. They won't release them unless there's oxytocin in the system, but it does the milk production. Okay, growth hormone, I've got bone, muscle, adipose, but it's every tissue in your body can respond to growth hormone. Um, every time your body's healing itself, it's growth hormone. So lots of receptors for that. TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Well, there's your thyroid gland and your thyroid gland produces T3 and T4. Um, T4 is called thyroxin, but thyroid hormones are so important to monitor in people as general health that they include looking at those hormones when you're doing a basic blood chemistry test on anyone there's things you, you look like blood urea nitrogen and they look at thyroid hormones can has anyone ever heard of some thyroid hormone diseases they're pretty common so 
them may see you're shaking your head. Hyperthyroidism and then the opposite is hypothyroidism. So common, you even have it in animals, right? Or animals, but it's more common for women to be hypothyroid and more common for men to be hyperthyroid. Right? Not saying that they can't flip around. Yes. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, I've seen commercial for it too. They're really hitting it because they got this drug to treat it. But yeah, that's called exophthalmos. And you can get it with thyroid diseases uh, or disorders like uh, Graves' disease and things like that. Yeah, it's a real thing. Okay. ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. And this is the adrenal cortex is the um, outside. So I'm going to highlight that's the cortex. Okay. This is the medulla inside pink it's not i don't know if it's pink but anyway so big thing that those adrenal cortex um cells can produce are sex steroids a little bit of estrogen a little bit of testosterone in both males and females but the big one is cortisol cortisol is anyone familiar with cortisol if i were to sneak into your homes next thursday evening and draw blood from you and run a panel i bet your cortisol levels would be really high Cortisol is your stress hormone. It's also a natural anti-inflammatory, right? That's what cortisol is. Okay. And then FSH in the ovaries and testes causes maturation of eggs and sperm. So remember I said the hypothalamus controls all things reproductive. It does it by secreting GnRH, which makes the pituitary secrete these things. And then these things happen. LH, it causes the ovaries to produce estrogen, and the testes to produce testosterone. And obviously ovulation happens with the ovary, right? I know I had put it under testosterone, but right. It's actually a surge in LH mid cycle, mid monthly cycle that causes that egg to come exploding out of the ovary. So in a nutshell, if you had to study the entire endocrine system, like what the hypothalamus does, what the pituitary does, and then what those pituitary hormones cause to happen in your body, you could do it in those three slides, all right? And then I'll go into more detail about gland by gland, and then the disorders you're going to see as nurses, the very common ones. So here's the flow diagram, and let me make sure that my... No, I just want to do that. Make sure it's working through the PowerPoint. It's thinking. There we go. And there it is. Okay. Okay. So let's minimize that. Um, but basically, if I were, to, I'm not going to do it, but let's say you're practicing. And this is how you can study the entire endocrine system. Let's say we start with GnRH, what the hypothalamus secretes. What we just saw, pituitary secrete LH and FSH. And then over here, you'd say, well, LH causes, I'm not going to fill the whole thing, estrogen production and ovulation in the ovary and testosterone production in the testes. And then FSH causes, in both ovaries and testes, egg sperm maturation, match it with the gonad, all right? And once you can fill out this blank flow diagram, you've got that, all right? That's it. And after that, it's really endocrine disorders and stuff like that. But that's that's how I would study. When, when I was studying, because I went to a grad school and became a reproductive physiologist and endocrinologist, I remember asking my professor, waiting in an elevator, I said, how do you, how did you learn all these pathways? He said, write it out, write it out, write it out, write it out, write it out. And so, yeah, and he was right, right. Okay, so negative feedback, you know it very well. Okay, you're not going to be able to let go of it. I'm going to keep coming back to every chapter. Your endocrine system is controlled by negative feedback. All right. So if the blood levels of a hormone are too low, the hypothalamus is going to sense that. Even the pituitary can sense it too. And it will do something to get it back up. If it's too high, hypothalamus and often the pituitary would do something to bring it back down to normal range. All right. So you know that. All right. So just keep in mind. That's how your entire endocrine system works. Now, how many people know how hormonal birth control works? Seems like a fair question, right? Many, many reproductive age women are on hormonal birth control, pill, patch, injection, um, implant, uh, cervical 
ring, you have a ring, uh, however you get the hormones into your body, right? But has anyone ever asked you how it works? Oh, well, it's kind of a good thing for someone coming to a doctor's office to be prescribed birth control to kind of know how it works, all right? It works by negative feedback. You're taking into your body, however you get it into your body, a synthetic form of estrogen and a synthetic form of progesterone. They usually combine the two because it's easier on the body than just pure estrogen. But pure progesterone would work too. That's how um, the depot shot works. But you get taking synthetic hormones into your body. And as they build up in your bloodstream, the levels of those hormones rise. The hypothalamus can't tell the difference between the synthetic hormones and the real ones your body produces. And so it wants to fix it by negative feedback. So if they're high, the hypothalamus will stop releasing GnRH. That makes the pituitary stop releasing LH and FSH. Without the FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, the eggs won't mature in the ovary. Without the LH, there could be no, there's no ovulation. You need LH for ovulation. So what hormonal birth control does through negative feedback is it keeps the ovary quiet. So the egg's not maturing. It's certainly not ovulating. If you hear from people and it's kind of crazy in this environment where Supreme Court is going to wonder if they're going to allow people to have access to birth control because whatever, it doesn't cause abortion. If anyone ever comes in and says, I heard birth control causes abortion. That's a bunch of bullshit. It really is. Get some biology courses on you. It stops the egg from maturing and you don't ovulate. It keeps the ovary quiet. Can't get pregnant if the egg doesn't leave the ovary. All right. That's how hormonal birth control works. Negative feedback. And it's been on the market for 60 years now. All right. But that's why I have this here. And here's the application, a very common thing. This is how the negative feedback works. And so, all right. So can you think of a hormone that is not regulated through negative feedback? But by positive feedback, oxytocin, that is a positive feedback hormone. That's the one example in the endocrine system that's positive feedback related. Everything else is negative feedback. Okay, so just to bring that home, if the hypothalamus senses that growth hormone in the blood is too high, it's going to reduce secretion of growth hormone releasing hormone. Okay. And then the pituitary will stop. I'll just put GH secretion because it saves space. Okay, that's it. So if I had this on a future test or something, all right, negative feedback. If the blood uh, growth hormone is too low, the hypothalamus will increase. Oh, sorry. Yeah, GHRH. And then the pituitary will increase growth hormone secretion. Just that simple. Right. If the hypothalamus senses high estrogen, testosterone, I'll even add, or progesterone, any of these will do it. And this is what I was just talking about with hormonal birth control. So if it's rising, the hypothalamus will decrease. You tell me what's the hormone it would release to affect the gonads. G. N for the N and gonad, R G N R H. Now, when that happens, the pituitary will decrease LH and FSH or stop it basically. Okay. And that right there is how hormonal birth control works is because it's synthet synthetic estrogen or progesterone that you take into your body, shuts this down, shuts that down. Also, if people are taking anabolic steroids, and I'm not just going to say guys, because girls do too. All right. For I knew someone in graduate school and she was at the gym. We'd go to the gym and she was buff. Right. And I knew she was juicing. I knew it. OK. All right. Um, but anyway, and she was talking about she was having a hard time with her husband conceiving a child. I'm like, I didn't say this to her. I was much more tactful. But I basically said, if you're taking any supplements that are hormonal, like anabolic steroids. All right. Basically, synthetic testosterone. When levels of that synthetic testosterone rise in the bloodstream. Yeah, she's getting well-defined muscles, big muscles, but the hypothalamus is shutting down this and then it shuts down that. And without FSH, her eggs aren't maturing without LH, they're not ovulating. She's basically on hormonal birth control using anabolic steroids. All right. Um, negative feedback complications for men is uh, basically high testosterone shuts down this, shuts down that. 
without the FSH, you're not maturing sperm. So a man who's abusing anabolic steroids for a long period of time can become sterile. I mean, once you stop taking them, the, 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 the gonads will start producing sperm again. Um, and without LH, they, their testes won't produce their own testosterone, but they're taking a synthetic one. But the testes can shrink because of this being shut down. All right, the ovaries can become quiet and shrink a little bit. They downregulate is what it's called. When you come off the hormones, they upregulate it again and they start working again. All right, but that's the real thing with taking these synthetic hormones. Such a great question. Yeah. Um, so anytime you take an aspirin, there's side effects. You take a synthetic steroid hormone in your body like estrogen, progesterone. Um, there's always a side effect. They're, they're powerful. Um, if you read the package insert, and patients never do, <laughs> um, there's risks of taking these. It, you've, you've increased a short-term increase in blood pressure, increased risk of throwing a clot and having a stroke. It's small. It's very small, but not impossible. Um, so there's side effects. For some women, they, they uh, get breast tenderness. It usually goes away. And some other things, too. Read the package insert. Yes, the FDA was doing studies for a male hormonal birth control based on synthetic testosterone, but they stopped the study because they complained of the side effects. Um, there's other methods out, out there that aren't hormonal. Basil gel is on the horizon, should be out there too. But, but other countries absolutely do have, they have all the variations that we have. Um, they have a patch, they have a pill, they have an implant, they have an injection, all right? of a synthetic testosterone. So in other countries, men can be on our, on this hormonal birth control. Just fizzled out in our country. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. If thyroid hormone is too low, hypothalamus will increase TRH and that makes the pituitary increase TSH for thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, I'm not gonna go over this. I'm gonna have it as a reading assignment. I think I had it back in chapter one, but I want you to revisit it to understand the negative feedback regulation of uh, testosterone. So what I just described about testosterone, if you're taking it, how it shuts down, this and this and the effects that that can have, along with other things like roid rage and acne and all kinds of other problems, also increased risk of stroke. Corticosteroids. Now, I think I had you read that back in chapter one, but since we're gonna be talking about cortisol soon, coming from the adrenal cortex. Cortisol is anti-inflammatory. It's also a stress hormone, but it's your body's natural anti-inflammatory. People who have inflammatory disorders, either on their skin or inside their body, like irritable bowel syndrome or all kinds of things, they can take synthetic prednisone, prednisolone, whatever alones they have out there. It's a synthetic cortisol. Oh, so the levels of cortisol rise in the body because you're taking this synthetic prednisone, whatever. The hypothalamus says, oh, it's high. So I'm going to shut down CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. That makes the pituitary shut down ACTH. And that means your own adrenal cortex is not being stimulated by any hormone, no ACTH. Your adrenal glands, while you're on these powerful um, anti-inflammatories, steroidal anti-inflammatories, your adrenal gland can shrink because it's not being stimulated, it downregulates, just like the testis would downregulate or the ovaries downregulate, it does the same thing, right? And when you, know, when you come off them, do you just stop cold turkey or do you take lower dose for like a, a few days or I don't know how many days? And then do you know the, the sequence? No, I don't either, I'd have to Google it. But you're supposed to take lower dose, lower dose, and then maybe go on alternating days. Because if you stop cold turkey, your adrenal gland has shrunken. And it's not going to start producing cortisol on its own for a little bit of time. It takes time to upregulate. Does all that make sense? Okay. So one day when you're talking to a patient who's being prescribed prednisone, you'll need to let them know this stuff. Okay. Good deal. All right. Okay. The disorders. The ones I think you'll see. Um, now, sorry about this. It always is in the way. So I've also got a clinical app online about growth hormone disorders. So if you don't have enough growth hormone, you can have pituitary dwarfism. The pituitary is not releasing enough growth hormone. 
most people have on the door jam, they have little pencil marks of the kid's height and everything, and they're tracking it. And you can, you know, with your pediatrician, whatever, know what height your child should be, like what percentile they should be for growth at their age. All right. And so if they're not making those benchmarks, they're not hitting those milestones, then you get to the pediatrician, you find out what's going on. It could be nutrition, you know, I mean, but they can also draw blood and see if growth hormone levels are adequate. And if they're not, then they can prescribe growth hormone and get that child on track. Um, so pituitary dwarfism. So I don't know, this was Bern Troyer, and I don't know that these people actually have pituitary dwarfism because um, there's things called acromegaly and all these things. But if you don't have enough growth hormone, you're going to be short in stature. Now in our country, if access to healthcare and you're charting your child's growth, you catch it before it becomes a problem like this. But if you go to other countries, nurses, doctors without borders, right? You might see stuff like this because people don't have access to healthcare. Um, and so that stuff doesn't get corrected. Now you can have excess growth hormone. That's what you're probably gonna more likely see in our country. Um, so here we have a 14 year old boy and that is ridiculous amount of height for that age. I mean, we know some kids can be tall, but um, when the onset of the excess growth hormone happens, um, when it's childhood, it's called gigantism. If the onset of the excess growth hormone happens in an adult, it's called acromegaly. So when I think of the A, I think of adult. Okay, I talked about the dangers of too much growth hormone and people who are taking it and it's not being prescribed. It does make you grow, all right? Your bones will then not only lengthen, um, in children they will, in children they will, because their growth plates aren't fused yet, right? So the bones can elongate, they can also thicken. That puts tremendous strain on your knees and your hips and can cause premature arthritis and joint damage. That is irreversible. Once the stuff is damaged, it's not coming back, right? Can you imagine a 16-year-old kid who hasn't been found out that they have gigantism and all of a sudden they're having pain, find out that they do a scan of their joints and you see the cartilage is er eroding away, right? And they're going to have to have knee replacement by the time they're 20, right? not good. Um, in adulthood, since the growth plates are fused, the bone thickens and it becomes distorted because there's no give, all right? So here's a woman that, that was diagnosed and over time, you see her jaws thicken, her brow thicken, the bone is thickening. And this is happening all over her body and it becomes quite distorted because you can't elongate the bones, they'll only thicken. And yes, it does damage the joints. I don't know if anyone remembers that old wrestler, um, Andre the Giant, he died younger than he should have because it's really hard on your body. So. Uh, not a good thing. You're like, oh, great, basketball scholarship. No, going to get knee replacement by the time you're 20. <laughs> so not so good. Not so good. Okay. Pituitary adrenocorticotropic hormone. In response to this, I actually have to make a correction on my slide. Okay. Um, oops, my screen you'll make sex steroids, all right? Estrogen, testosterone, just a little bit, all right? So ladies, don't worry. Oh my God, my adrenal gland is producing some testosterone. Oh, I'm gonna grow a five o'clock shadow. No, no, no. The amount of testosterone coming out is minuscule compared to the huge amount of estrogen that's gonna mask the effects of that. And the exact true is opposite for uh, men, that a little bit of estrogen is not gonna affect you because a huge amount of testosterone in your body certainly masks any of that. Now, the interesting time comes when a woman hits menopause and her ovaries shut down, stop producing estrogen. Then sometimes, not in all women, don't freak out, that little bit of testosterone could have some effects. Some hairs start to thicken. Um, that women lose an hourglass shape because that's really dependent on estrogen, all right? But this estrogen, small amount of estrogen that they produce in their adrenal glands is not enough to reverse any signs of menopause because you're losing huge amounts from the ovary shutting down. Okay, mineral corticoids. They're called corticoids because they're coming from the adrenal cortex. Mineral, think salts. That's why they call them mineral corticoids. Something from the adrenal cortex is going to affect salts. And so what, and the stimulus, I'll, I'll write it down first. Aldosterone. Okay, and I'll change the color. And 
highlight the A and the L and the S and the T. And if you rearrange those, they spell salt. So aldosterone increases salt retention in the kidneys to increase water retention. So the stimulus, I'll put here, stimulus for aldosterone secretion is really not ACTH, but it's coming from that adrenal gland, so that's why I put it here. The stimulus is low blood pressure. All right, we'll get to the cardiovascular system. We'll talk about this. This is one of the things that the nursing program wants you to know about aldosterone and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So when your blood pressure goes down, we know the medulla can do its thing to increase your heart rate, vasoconstrict your blood vessels. But that quick fix only lasts like less than a minute. If blood pressure is really low, aldosterone will get secreted into your bloodstream, goes down to your kidneys and makes you retain salt. If salt crosses a membrane, we learn this, all right? Will water follow it by osmosis? Yeah. So if you retain salt and it goes back into your bloodstream, water from your kidney tubules goes across into the bloodstream too. And when your blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up. All right. So that's going to be a nursing thing. Now I'll, I'll cover it much later on. Okay. Glucocorticoids. It's corticoid because it's coming from the adrenal cortex right here. And gluco makes you think glucose, right? It is a hormone that does affect glucose levels in your, in your blood. So let me change this back to black. Uh, cortisol. It is anti-inflammatory. And it is your stress hormone. Okay, and I'll get to this later. But when you're stressed under the influence of cortisol, your blood glucose will go up. You become hyperglycemic because your body feels it's stressed. And so it wants to mobilize its energy reserves because the body is stressed. And so cortisol, so people who are taking anti-inflammatories for an inflammatory event, that can actually raise their blood glucose. What happens to the person who has, oh, Crohn's disease, right? It's inflammatory in the bowel. And they're taking prednisone because they want to reduce that inflammation. If they're also diabetic, does that make things interesting? It does. All right. So just giving you a little hint about nursing pharmacology. A drug might be good for one purpose, but if that patient comes with a secondary condition, it makes things complicated. Okay. Uh, so then again, the uh, clinical app of taking prednisone and the negative feedback thing. Okay. And I already mentioned this on one of the first slides, but under sympathetic regulation, the hypothalamus stimulates the adrenal medulla middle part to make epinephrine. So I know you're studying this now for the exam that's coming up. You now know what epinephrine causes to happen, all these areas of the body, what receptor it works by, so on and so forth, all right? But the hypothalamus is in control of all of that. All right, so moving right along, disorders. Cushing's disease, um, also known as hypercortisolism, it's from excess cortisol. So I think of excess cortisol, the C and the C in Cushing's, I pair it together. Cushing's disease is very common. It's even common in animals, all right? Um, so for whatever reason, your hypothalamus could be producing too much of that or pituitary secreting too much of that or your adrenal gland, you could have a tumor there. It doesn't have to be cancerous. It's just an abnormal growth is what a tumor is. And so now you're pumping out extra cortisol. Well, that has an effect because the body likes things in normal range. And when it isn't, here's the problems you're going to see. It's telltale. In addition to drawing blood and measuring cortisol levels, you would see this in your patient hyperglycemia, and I'm going to misspell it to save space, high blood glucose. Because your body's stressed and cortisol causes glucose release, probably mostly coming from the liver. Okay. Oops. There we go. Hyperlipidemia. What's it sound like it is? High blood lipids. 
So when your body's stressed, it mobilizes its resources. Glucose is a resource. We now know lipids are, the body could use lipids to make energy and stuff like that. Um, so a patient who has this disorder, they're gonna have high blood glucose. They're gonna have high fatty acids and triglycerides in their bloodstream. What happens if the patient has Cushing's and they also have a cardiovascular disease and their triglycerides are already high, even worse now, right? Um, hypervolemia, that means high blood volume. Because you're retaining fluid. I just say retaining water. Okay. So people who have this disorder, they can swell up because they're retaining water. So they can have swelling in the abdomen, but they can also have it in the face. It's called moon face. People who are on because of a chronic inflammatory condition they have, prednisone all the time, can develop Cushing's like symptoms because your body can't tell the difference between real cortisol and the synthetic ones you're taking into your body, all right? So if you have hypervolemia, high blood volume, that means you have high blood pressure. Let's put high BP, all right? So now if we have a patient who has Cushing's but also already has high blood pressure, B, all right? It gets very interesting. But does that make sense? And have you ever heard of Cushing's disease? My mom has a dog. She's a cush the dog's a Cushing's disease. They've got a little pot belly box around in the pot. It's just a short dog too. So the belly's just about touching the ground. Uh, but yeah, it's very common, very common. Okay, opposite. Um, I'm gonna have you emphasize Addison's, the A, with insufficient aldosterone. Yes, it's also low cortisol, but I want you to focus on one hormone because it's too much. All right, so focus on the low aldosterone. What did I tell you aldosterone causes the body to retain? Salt, because it's got A-L-S-N-T, -A which spells salt. So the role of aldosterone is to make you retain salt, then retain water to fix your blood pressure. If you have low aldosterone, you're not gonna be retaining salt. Where's it going? It's going out in your pee. Guess what follows salt out in the pee? Water, okay? Okay, same things could cause the problem, all right? Or autoimmune, interesting. So here's the presentation. They're gonna have hyponatremia and the A and NA is salt, low blood salt, because you're losing it in the urine. I'll say lose salt in pee, how about that? Okay. Now, for whatever reason, sodium and potassium, they always seem to be going in opposite directions. So if you're losing salt, um, sodium, I'll put that over salt, you retain potassium, high blood potassium. And the kalemia and hyperkalemia, the K is for the potassium symbol. Now, I talked about high blood potassium before. I said, it's very dangerous. It could slow your heart rate down. You'll have bradycardia. It, can, it, it, it actually is used, uh, injection of um, potassium chloride is used to stop the heart and um, lethal injections and things like that. So that's not good, okay? Um, if you are losing salt out in your pee, water is following it. So you have low blood volume, okay? losing H2O in P. If your blood volume is low, what happens to your blood pressure? Low blood pressure. It's because you're, you're losing body water out in your pee, all right? What you'll also see is anorexia, but it's quick loss in weight, all right? Um, quick weight loss, but not the good kind. Anytime someone's weight changes dramatically over a short period of time, they're, it's not fat, it's, it's body water, anorexia, okay? And they also have low blood glucose. And I'll put after this, the low blood glucose is from the low cortisol. That's the one thing that comes from the low cortisol aspect of this. So they, their blood glucose could bottom out, they could pass out. All right. And then for some reason, I don't understand how this works and I've never really looked it up, but it can cause bronzing of the skin. It stimulates your skin's melanocytes to put down more pigment. Um, I don't know exactly how that's happening, but these are the classic 
Add, um, Addison's symptoms that you'll see. All right. Okay. How are we doing? Good. Oh, Kahn's syndrome, hyper aldosteronism, excess. So all you have to do to know the presentation is the reverse of Addison's. Now you have too much salt retention, too much water retention, right? It just, all the stuff I just put down reverses. So the presentation is hypernatremia, high blood salt, and I'll put sodium, all right? These people might have a high or fast heart rate. It's all that sodium. They will have hypo low blood potassium. I'll just put that, all right? Another way that the heart rate could drop. I'm, I'm sorry, it, you're, the heart rate goes up because there's not enough potassium to slow it down. And then this, hypervolemia, low blood volume. I'm oh, sorry, hi. Get with the program this morning, high blood volume. Because you are retaining water with the salt. Water will follow salt anywhere it goes, like a little puppy dog. So if you retain it, it goes back into your bloodstream, that's the water follows it. And then with the hypervolemia, you have high blood pressure. And is there one more? And then you have weight gain, you're retaining water. All right, I don't think I have anything after that. No, I don't. But does that kind of make sense? Now that I've explained what aldosterone does, now you know what happens if you don't have enough. What happens if you have too much? And these are common enough that you're going to see them. Probably Cushing's and uh, Addison's you'll see a lot. Um, all right. Oh, here's an interesting one. Big, long word. Pheochromocytoma. Um, and now it's your adrenal medulla, which produces epinephrine if the hypothalamus is stimulating it. This is a real condition. Um you're on full fight flight all the time because your adrenal medulla is pumping out too much epinephrine. We've all felt the fight flight feeling in our body, right? Imagine if you had to feel that for 24 hours. That'd be pretty rough on the body. These people, their heart's gonna, their heart's gonna stop. It's gonna give out. It's too much. All right. If someone's diagnosed with this, you gotta fix it. Uh, so they'll have high heart rate. Because of the epinephrine. They will have hypertension because their heart rate is skyrocketing. They will have rapid breathing. Okay, all that, this just the fight flight symptoms. You have a hyperglycemia. Your body's stressed. It's gonna release its resources like glucose. And the other resource other than glucose is lipids. I blood lipids. So this must be horrible. I don't like feeling fight flight for more than a few minutes, which is probably what most of us have experienced that something scary happened. But having that 24 seven, yeah. Oh, and then it says nervousness, um, sweating, anxiety. Yeah, because you're in fight flight, right? Okay, time for another one. I think we do. Oh, not working. Okay, now we get to the thyroid gland disorders, the ones you're definitely gonna see because they're so common. So um, here's the thyroid on the anterior view of the trachea and larynx. And then if you flip it around, look at the posterior view, the green things are parathyroids, opposite, um, opposite body surfaces. So your thyroid hormones, triiodothyronine thyroid, is just T3 because of the tri. And then thyroxin is known as T4. And those are measured in every single blood panel, pretty much. They regulate your body's metabolism, how fast your cells are working, um, how much ATP they make, kind of just your body's internal furnace, I'll call it. And it also secretes calcitonin, CA for calcium. It will decrease your blood calcium, right? But most people, when they think of thyroid gland and what it does, they're thinking about these hormones. I don't know of any disorders of this that could be out there, but they're not common. Now, the parathyroid glands located on the opposite side produce parathyroid hormone, 
which will increase your blood calcium. So it's kind of a check and balance system here. But thyroid hormones. So it's how fast your cells are working, kind of your internal furnace. If your thyroid glands are not producing enough thyroid hormones, T3, T4, you're going to have basically low metabolic activity. You're going to be tired, sluggish, depressed, things like that. If you're hyperthyroid, okay, now your body's running, your, your internal furnace is really jacked up. You're going to have nervousness, sweating, high heart rate, all these things. Everything's on hyperdrive. All right. So thyroid gland disorders, hyperthyroidism is excess thyroid hormones, more common in males. I'll put more common. I'll just say more. For whatever reason, not that a woman can't be hyperthyroid. Um, lots of things can cause it. Tumors, Graves disease is an autoimmune disorder where your antibodies are produced that attack your thyroid receptors and they hammer it. Remember when I talked about beta agonists, like dobutamine is a beta one agonist and it makes the heart beat faster by stimulating the beta one receptor on the heart. So it's pounding on that receptor. And so it's having more of the effect. Graves disease, the antibodies produced hammer the thyroid gland receptors similarly. All right. And that's going to cause overstimulation of the thyroid receptors. And that will explain some of the symptoms that you see. Okay. Clinical presentation of someone with low thyroid hormones. Um, sorry, excess, excess thyroid. Again, I need some, something with caffeine. This tea is not cutting it. Mm. So your body's internal furnace is jacked up. So metabolism is high, anxiety, nervousness, um, you, since you're literally your internal furnace is really working hard, you can have um, sweating. You're sweating profusely. You don't tolerate um, the heat very well because your body's overdrive. Really? Like overnight? Wow. So she probably had some aggressively growing. Was did they find out it was a tumor? It was, was it benign? Okay. All right. That's good. But that, that kind of excess growth is indicative of tumor growth. Yeah. Um, your heart rate's high because well, your metabolism's on you know, hyperdrive, hypertension because of the high heart rate, and then increased fluid deposition behind the eyes makes the eyeballs protrude out. They won't come all the way out, but they'll bulge. That's called exophthalmos. Okay. And the, so this is, it's hard to see, but this is someone whose eyes are kind of bulging out. All right. That's because of the excess thyroid hormones or something that's hammering thyroid receptors in the thyroid gland. All right. Okay. So goiter. If you have hyperthyroidism, you might, pre might present with a goiter is um, increased thyroid gland growth. If you have, say, a thyroid tumor like your grandmother had, all right and it, you get too much of these thyroid hormones, the thyroid gland is being overstimulated. It could be maybe the pituitary was secreting too much TSH, who knows, but it actually proliferates. It grows because it's being stimulated too much. It could be antibodies are hitting the receptors on the thyroid gland, hammering it, hammering it, and that makes it overstimulated and, and it grows. So you can have a goiter with hyperthyroidism. Yeah, I can also have it with hypothyroidism. That one's hard to understand, but we have to wait until Monday. <laughs> the time is out.